Hi, I'm Jenny Shampoo, the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog. I'm joined today uh, by Matthew Bowman. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks so much. Um, Dr. Bowman is Associate Professor of History and Religion and Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University. He writes about religion in the 20th century United States. And today uh, we're talking about the scripture block in Mosiah 29 to Alma 4. And the artwork is by an artist named Stephanie K. Northrup. And the piece is called The Burden of the Righteous King. Uh, it's uh, an acrylic painting on a panel. And Stephanie is an artist currently living in Colorado. Um, so Dr. Bowman, I just want to start with grounding us in the scriptures here. I think this piece is uh, pretty directly related to what's going on in Mosiah 29. Can you tell us what's happening there and how this artwork relates? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the artwork is particularly interested in something that the Book of Mormon is really interested in at this point, which is um, politics and theory of politics and how to organize a society. And it's important, I think, to recall that toward the end of Mosiah, um, Nephite society is really struggling with a set of new challenges that the Book of Mormon has not overtly described um, happening before, and particularly um, two. The first is the challenge of pluralism and diversity. It's important, I think, to recall that at this point, the Nephites have absorbed the Mulekites, right, and other new people. Um, whom they have encountered, who it appears there is some um, linguistic d differences between the Nephites and the Mulekites that would um, make that difficult. Uh, they've also absorbed a set of refugees um, from the people of Zenith. These are the followers of Alma, who have brought, it appears, a new idea to Nephite society, which is the idea of a church. Um, and that's, I think, really significant, right? Uh, Latter-day Saints today kind of assuming that a church is the way in which um, the the cultural notion of religion is expressed might take for granted that there is a sort of formal organization um, in the Book of Mormon all the way through. But that's not the case, right? It does appear that Alma is in some ways uh, the first to come up with this idea. And there's a so there's a new institution present in Nephite society. Um, it is called a church, um, and it seems fairly evident that Nephite society generally, and Mosiah particularly as the king, are grappling with the, a bit with how to place this in their society. What rights should the church have? How should members of the church relate to people who are not members of the church? So you see, I think, in this uh, piece, a lot of these ideas, these difficulties, um, expressed. Mm -hmm. So we're at the son of Benjamin, King Mosiah, and um, he's maybe coming, he knows he's coming towards the end of his life and his son Aaron declines the kingdom, right? He offers the kingship to pass on to him. He declines, his other sons seem to also decline. So then what happens next? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I think um, Aaron's declining of the throne um, does create this little kind of um, crisis moment, right? Because it appears to spur in Mosiah some real reflection as to whether or not kings are a good idea in the first place, right? And how people should be governed, how a society um, should be organized. And Mosiah gives us in this in Mosiah twenty nine, right, a lot of reflection about that. Um, and he decides, I think, something interesting. Now, it's very common, I think, for us as modern Americans, right, Americans who kind of live with this cultural tradition of democracy and republicanism and so on, to see this shift in terms of a movement away from monarchy towards democracy. But I don't think that's quite right. Um, and I think this um, painting, I think, depicts some of these issues here. Um, what Mosiah seems to be describing in 29, um, and also a little bit later, is the difficulties of a society governed by a single person. That is the problem of investing all power in one figure, whether that figure be a king or a judge. Um, right. Um, we move to Mosiah um, calls these people judges, right? And he, and he describes judges as something like a series of elected office holders. Um, but he really emphasizes when he's describing the judges, anyway, when he's describing society generally, how important it is to 
distribute power widely across mm-hmm. a society, right? And how there should be no single judge in charge, just as there should be no single king in charge. And almost immediately as we go into early Alma, we see that proposition, uh, sorry, the early book of Alma, I should say, we see that proposition tested um, as a person named Nehor emerges, right? And Nehor is, he's often called an antichrist um, figure in company with Sherem and Korahor later, uh, but he poses, I think, both a religious and a political challenge to this new Nephite order, because Nehor seems to be um, doing everything Mosiah warns against. Uh, <laughs> that is, he is a populist leader. Um, he develops a kind of cult of personality around himself, which is precisely what Mosiah had warned against with Aaron, right? He says, I, I, I'd be worried if my son were to become kind of this, um, well, you know, the, the figure we often see them use as a, as a sort of dark model is King Noah, right? And he right. says, I, I worry that my son would become another King Noah that right. is kind of gluttonous and power hungry and all of that. And that's what Nehor seems to be. Um, and we see this expressed particularly um, in Nehor's arguments that clergy should be paid, um, that he becomes wealthy, right? Um, he, he wants to create this sort of kind of ruling class with himself at the head. He, um, Nehor kills Gideon um, and argues essentially that he should be an exception to the law against murder because he has the support of the people, mm. um, right? Which is this real kind of sense of, you know, he is... He is a Noah figure. And so he is, I think Mormon, you know, Mormon, of course, is our editor, our redactor, our author, is putting Nehor here, particularly as an illustration of everything that Mosiah was worried about. Yeah, um, you're right. Mosiah actually specifically mentions Noah in in, uh, verses 17 and 18 of this chapter 29, where, again, he talks about he says, how much iniquity doth one wicked king cause to be committed? Yea, and what great destruction. Yea, remember King Noah, his wickedness and his abominations. Um, so yeah, just like you were saying, just this this power of, of one wicked person to bring down a whole society. And, and Mosiah is is always talking about equality, right? And, and bringing, mm-hmm. like you said, bringing these different groups together and serving with the people. Um, he starts this chapter by calling the people his brethren. He says, Mm -hmm. he says, my people or my brethren, for I esteem you as such. So right off the bat, he's, he's saying, I'm one of you. I'm, I'm interested in securing your welfare, your equality, Mm -hmm. your freedom, your peace, right? Yeah, yeah, precisely. You know, when he talks about the judges, right, and this is something that struck me as I was reviewing this chapter this morning, um, is that, you know, we often think of the judges as being elected, and that's why they're significant, and that's why they're important. Um, But it's not quite that, right? Mosiah emphasizes over and over that the judges have checks on each other, Mm -hmm. that there are higher judges and lower judges, and the lower judges can actually remove the higher judges should that become necessary, Right. Um, right? So it is very much, I think that word you use, a quality is really significant here. Mm-hmm. Mosiah seems to see that yeah. uh, as a real check on you know, what we've been told is in many ways the great sin, which is the sin of pride. Um, okay, so let's look at the artwork a little bit. Um, first, I just want to talk about the style here. I mean, it's definitely more abstract than a lot of LDS art that we see. Um, how do you think that functions for this piece? Does it does it work for you? It it does actually, and and um, I'm glad it is non non representational, um, because you know, that made me think of how we often read the Book of Mormon, which is to say we tend often to read it as a series of kind of discrete um, parables um, or a series of discrete you know fables like Aesop's fables about specific people. Right. And to say, like, you know, here's um, how Nephi reacted. Here's what Alma did. And we look at these people as examples for ourselves. We don't often read the Book of Mormon at a more kind of philosophical, abstract level. Right. To say, what are the Book of Mormon's ideas uh-huh. about a broad political question like how to best organize a society? Mm-hmm. Um, right. And um, now, there are a couple of these abstract lessons that we, that we do um, sometimes mention in the Book of Mormon, one being um, the notion of wealth, 
Mm-hmm. Wealth in the Book of Mormon is consistently depicted as, you know, and you, and you see Mosiah saying this, right, as a burden, as something that's heavy, as something that drags you down. Um, and that is, I think, so kind of cunningly represented here, right? But the idea of wealth as a burden is really dramatically influenced here. You see, right, of course, um, the gold on yeah. these people. Um, and on, on so many of them, right, these, these human figures, the gold is you could read it as pulling them down, right? They're all leaning. Um, they all seem to be bearing great weight and they are falling on the king um, who is being driven into the earth, right? right. So there's a real kind of profound illustration, yeah. uh, I think, of that principle um, here. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I'm so glad you picked up on that detail of this, that she's very conspicuously added these gold elements on top of the figures. And even King um, Mosiah has a gold crown and he's in these purple robes, sort of, you know, a mm-hmm. symbol of royalty. Um, the the artist um, actually did a little video about some of her artworks. And she said in this piece, she wanted to show um, that King Mosiah and his people that, that they all, that the wealth was spread across, like that Mosiah wasn't taking um, the gold mm-hmm. or the wealth from the people for himself, but he, that the people still um, were, were equal to him in that way. Yeah, but the, but still leaning on yeah. him, right? Which I think yeah. which I think is really interesting, and that's that's I think a, this is really kind of cunning representation yes. of how the Book of Mormon depicts this, which is to say, right, that um, wealth is often um, people like Nehor or Noah, right, bring wealth to themselves um, in pursuit of kind of pride, self-aggrandizement, that sort of thing. But then it always in the Book of Mormon ends up becoming a social problem, right? It always ends up becoming a problem that someone like Mosiah then is tasked with fixing, with cleaning up, um, right? And so the people kind of falling on him, um, even, and he's not asking for this, right? He's not leaning towards them. They are leaning towards him. So let's let's just actually look at the script, the verses here. This is in verse thirty three and thirty four. Um, he he writes, um, and many more things did King Mosiah write unto them, unfolding unto them all the trials and troubles of a righteous king, yea, all the travails of soul for their people, and also all the murmurings of the people to their king. And he explained it all unto them, and he told them that these things ought not to be, <laughs> that the burden should come upon all the people, that every man might bear his part. Okay, what's what's your response to that mm-hmm. and, and with this artwork, too? Yeah, yeah. So we could read this in two ways, right? First being... Um, we could see wealth as a burden here, yeah. right? As a as a struggle, as something that's causing problems um, for a society. And then that second part, right? That the burden should come upon all the people that every man might bear his part. Mm-hmm. Um, two things there. Um, and one I think you see illustrated here in a really interesting way, right? There's been so much conversation recently about the question of race in the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. Um, and and diversity in the Book of Mormon and that sort of thing. And a lot of that, um, these conversations, I think, orbit around trying to identify kind of particular groups, particular categories, that sort of thing. She represents that in some interesting ways here abstractly, yeah. right? So we see that pluralism that I talked about, that diversity of peoples in the Book of Mormon here, but presented in an abstract, non-representational way, which I think, again, allows us to consider these problems Um, as universals, in a sense, right? How should all human beings think about diversity in a society, not just how should the Nephites think about diversity? Um, Secondly, um, Mosiah says, as you say, the burden should come upon all the people that every man bear his part. Two ways of thinking about that, right? The first is um, the problems should not just come to the king, Mm -hmm. that the king cannot solve all these social problems himself right. um, because not only is that impossible for one person to fix everything but also right it leads to an imbalanced sinful society right because you're in- inevitably if one king has all that power you're inevitably going to get a noah you're inevitably going to get a nehor right you're inevitably going to get someone who becomes corrupt mm. um but second right um He's calling here fairly explicitly 
for an, a more egalitarian society in which wealth and burdens are much more equally shared. Hmm. Well, everybody kind of bears up, right? Everybody contributes. Nobody is passive. Um, this is then not simply a democracy, right? Not simply an electoral democracy, but it's also a society with um, separation of powers. It's also a society that calls for a great deal of civic involvement um, on on the part of all of these people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and, and again, like you said, in this painting, it's showing that they don't quite have it right here because Mosiah is bearing an undue burden and literally being driven into the ground by this burden, um, try, trying to, to help the people. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I feel like the whole book of Mosiah is, is so much about these political ideas of, of kings or judges or righteous kings or wicked kings. And we're shown examples very clearly of, of each and they're contrasted with each other. Um, so I guess just in, in conclusion, I think this is this is probably a nice way to sort of cap off the book of Mosiah to think about um, the, the right way to um, for a society to work together um, and and for for leaders and citizens to to work together. What what are your final thoughts here on um, your response to this artwork or or these chapters? Yeah, you know, um, well, this piece in particular, it's kind of deceptively simple, I think. Mm -hmm. But the more I kind of ponder it, um, the more interesting things I see in it, um, right? I, um, I really, as, as I'm just looking at it now, I really like the way she's created this almost like a, a series of dominoes falling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because that does emphasize, in one sense, the burden on the king, but also these people's burdens on each other, the pressure they're putting on each other, the um, the weight that every individual is suffering, not only that the king is suffering, okay. right? And and I think um, the more I look at this painting, the more I think there is in it, um, and I think the more applicable it is to all yeah. sorts of other stories we might get in the Book of Mormon or in Scripture generally. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts with us. I, I feel like this definitely helped me think about Mosiah 29, but also all of these chapters better. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for inviting me.